second speaker of this evening. Uh, the second speaker of this evening is uh, Piet van Janssen. And uh, Ruth Janssen is consultant uh, in smart builders at Deers. And um, Deers uh, is a company that introduces intelligent uh, smart builders that can adapt to the changing uses, the changing users, and the changing times. And uh, on your link page, uh, LinkedIn page, uh, you probably <laughs> described uh, your work uh, by asking, uh, in Munich, can you imagine a building that recognizes you as an individual, that helps you park your car, that navigates you to a free workplace and uh, automatically adjusts uh, the lighting and the temperature to your personal preferences? So uh, that sounds really uh, uh, yeah, uh, fascinating to me. And uh, it also resonates a little bit, I think, with what, what Constantine uh, already uh, uh, said. So um, Hugo is uh, going to give a talk about uh, smart solutions for living environments and uh, the added value of an integral smart concept in the edge. All right, give it up for now. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let's go to this presentation first. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> ah, that's me. <laughs> all right, well, thank you all for... Um, listening to, uh, coming to listen to my story. I think um, my story and the story from uh, Constantine have a lot in common because the company that I work for, Deerns, is um, well an, a consulting, engineering consulting company. We uh, engineer installations for, uh, for buildings and we also do a lot of work for, uh, for OVG actually. So the products, uh, of the, the projects that uh, came, uh, came by, you, always see so you also will see some of them in my presentation. Uh, and all the colors are a bit different than I had imagined on my um, on my laptop, but still I'm gonna go with uh, with this. But please think that it was a lot a lot picked a lot um, more beautiful than uh, how it looks now. So <laughs> don't think I'm a, I'm not a good at PowerPoint or anything. Um, <laughs> first, I have this got out of the way. I uh, I studied architecture in Delft, so a um, little bit of the enemy uh, the enemy here, I think. <laughs> But, um, and, and there are a lot of differences between Delft and, uh, and Eindhoven in, um, in that study because um, I, I did architecture, but uh, somehow the rest of my class was a lot, of, a lot better at architecture than I was because I was always thinking about, um, well, if the building can uh, stand, if it, it doesn't, uh, doesn't cost too much. And those were all things that uh, in Delft you shouldn't care about. It's just about how beautiful and how uh, nice the building looks and all the other things other people think about. So that's. At that point, I started out, um, well, going um, another way. So I, I, I went to corporate real estate management and did a master's uh, in that. And then somehow I ended up with building installations um, and started working at, uh, at Deerns. And uh, Deerns is uh, well, it's a nice company. It's a pretty old company, about nine years old at the moment. And we have 22 offices worldwide with six, 650 experts, engineers who are working on all kinds of, uh, of nice projects. Very sustainable uh, um, projects usually, a lot of different kinds of projects, usually pretty big with pretty complex installations like airports, uh, hospitals, uh, high-end office buildings, but also data centers, clean rooms. Um, the more complex it gets, the more interesting we like to think of the installations and how they work. Um, and well, actually I'm, um, as it said in the, in the program, I'm a consultant, uh, smart building at Deerns. But um, at the moment, my uh, job shifted to being the commercial director of B Grid, and uh, that's actually some kind of the same company. And uh, but I will come come ba back to it in uh, a little later. So you saw this picture already about um, well the most sustainable office building in the world. That's where it all started uh, for us to think about smart building as being uh, being Deerns, because we think this is also the world's first smart building. Well, and we all think uh, we thought of a lot of interesting ways to make this building very sustainable. We uh, th thought of an aquifer thermal energy storage beneath the building where we um, storage hot and cold to um, have a sustainable way of heating and cooling the building with heat pumps. And to um, run those heat pumps and all the other installations in the building, we use the electricity from PV panels, not only in the roof, but also in the facade who combined deliver uh, 165 kilowatts of electrical power, which is enough to um, provide energy for the building the whole year around. So I want to show you 
If it works, uh, a, sh a short uh, movie about the edge and, um, well, a little bit about the smart building that's in there. Welcome to the edge. This is certifiably the greenest office building in the world. But that just might be the least interesting part about it, because the edge in Amsterdam is also possibly the most connected office space in the world. Working at the edge is insane. It all starts with a smartphone app developed by the building's main tenant consulting firm, Deloitte. When you arrive at the edge, a camera recognizes you by your license plate for automatic access. And because it's the Netherlands, there are chargers available for electric cars. Inside, things start to get interesting because you don't have a desk. No one here does. Workspaces are assigned to you based on your schedule for the day. You have options. A work booth, a meeting room, what they call a concentration room, a sitting desk, a standing desk, a balcony desk. You can even just hang out in a sun-filled atrium all day. This concept is called pod desking, and it's what allows Deloitte to have 2,500 workers, but less than half as many desks at its Dutch headquarters. The app knows your preferences, and when you arrive at your workspace, the lights dim or brighten based on your store settings. And any of the building's massive flat screens can be instantly paired with an iPhone or a laptop. Well, what actually triggered us is um, what was just told by the narrator, that they have realized a building for um, more than 2,500 people, 2,500 employees, but only with 1,000 desks. So part of it is because of that's the way of working of Deloitte because a lot of people work out, uh, out, of, out of the office. But another way is about um, making the office smart, because making the office smart, you can be more efficient with your square meter, the square meters that you need. So actually you can build a building which um, has the capacity of a building with from 100,000 square meters, but actually uh, in the volume of 40,000 square meters. So you can think of that's a really very interesting business case, not only because of sustainability, because everything you don't have to build is actually the most sustainable, but also um, the added value for, um, uh, for the real estate you have. So that makes us, uh, that um, well brought us to think as Darren, so we should do something with this smart building because smart building obviously is the future. You see that, that people don't have desks anymore actually with well, with a tablet or a phone and a car, you can probably do every do the work that you need to do. So we uh, and, and we're shifting to what we're calling in Holland uh, uh, het nieuwe werken, but what is called in in English the activity-based working, um, which also has a lot of uh, disadvantages actually, because what we see in those kind of buildings, which uh, in which we're we're having this activity-based working is that, um, and we see that a, a lot in, in, um, uh, in buildings owned by the government, is that people, after they are standing still in, um, in a traffic jam for about an hour, they're also uh, lo looking for a free workspace for like 45 minutes because they don't have uh, their own workspace, so they're going from floor to floor to floor, and on busy days, um, it can be very difficult to find, to find a space. Also, maybe you know that because in, in educational buildings that often happens a lot that all the uh, rooms are, are occupied, um, at least in the system they are. And when you go actually walk past, past those rooms, they are mostly, the, the maybe half of them aren't occupied at all just because people don't show up or um, because they've already went away and booked it for too long. So there are all kinds of, of, of difficulties within those um, offices and especially those offices with those flexible, flexible workspaces. <coughs> And also other problems that you often see in, in buildings like uh, climate problems, security car problems, problems with parking your car, um, cleaning the whole building while it's actually used uh, for, for half, well, um, or building a very sustainable building but not using it sustainable. Um, and if, you're, um, if you want to solve all these problems, uh, you can do this with smart building and smart buildings use a lot of sensors. And if we look at the, ma uh, the amount of sensors that is used in buildings already, we're now in 2017, this year, um, 
the amount of sensors will be 250 million uh, sensors worldwide used in corporate real estate. This number will grow to 20 in 2020 to more than uh, a billion sensors um, in, the, uh, in, in, in the corporate real estate buildings, which is, um, which is, which is a lot. And this gets, um, we can get problems here if, if we don't manage this well. All those sensors, all those functionalities, all those smart building functionalities, we, we, if we don't manage this well, we think we can get into an internet of too many things where we just have, um, well, all these, um, all these functionalities, all these, all these applications within buildings which doesn't really add up to helping the people inside but just making it uh, um, doesn't work at all or may, uh, maybe even make it worse. <coughs> so what we want to do is we want to go to an integration of things where all these functionalities, all these sensors and all these uh, smart building applications come together in under, under one roof. So that the building is not a building just filled with some nice gadgets that doesn't work or even do the opposite for the people, but actually a building that supports the processes within and that makes the building feel like it's your, your personal assistant because that's what it should do. It should help you doing what you do in that building. If it's working, it must help, uh, help you doing your work. If it's uh, a museum, it must help you uh, having a good time and um, getting a nice tour in the museum. And we want to develop a system that, um, well, could do all that for all these different types of buildings. So we invented the B-Grid. And the B-Grid is um, an, a, a network of nodes within the building which has all kinds of sensors in it. Temperature sensor, humidity, light, CO2, sound. Um, and it can even um, sense presence of people uh, where they are in the building very accurately. And we... What we did is we implemented these <coughs> sensors into everything in the building. So in the building installations, because we're there, that's what we're good at, but also uh, connecting it with the phones, with the blinds, and uh, well, even with the coffee machine if it's necessary. And it must be open enough to connect with everything. And um, what's really key in this is that we can position people in the building. So we know exactly um, where people are in the building, where individuals are in the building, so we know how the building is used and that we can adapt to how the building is used. So all this information comes into um, well, what we call the BOS, the Building Operating System, a cloud platform where all the information, not only from the sensors, <coughs> but also from um, outside sources, like maybe uh, the building management system, but also <coughs> Uh, the traffic information and weather information all comes together in this cloud platform which we, uh, where we can uh, crunch the numbers and use it for all kinds of different applications. The uh, applications for the employee, applications for the facility manager, but also applications for the real estate manager. Well, and all these functions, what you see like workplace finding, indoor positioning, smart cleaning, predictive maintenance, that's all just the top of the iceberg because we think these kind of platforms should uh, enable um, smart building functionalities not only necessary now, but also necessary maybe in the future when you change the, um, the use of your building or uh, when you just um, need something else um, which adapts <coughs> to well, the period, uh, that period. So the BOS platform has all kind of well neat features. It actually is the Microsoft uh, Azure a cloud platform which have features like um, um, machine learning which we can use to for instance um, learn how people are using the building so at one moment we know the building learns that every Friday only 60% of the people show up <laughs> so when those people show up we can tell them okay you only use this floor or this wing of the building and we can just shut off the other half or maybe rent it out to, uh, to other people to use those offices to be a lot more sustainable <coughs> and a lot more effective with the real estate. So what we actually want is we want to use the building as your smartphone. Like, um, because a smartphone, if you look at it, for the past few years is pretty much the same hardware. It's, uh, it adds some, uh, some sensors here and there, but actually it's pretty much the same, but everybody uses it very differently. So we uh, want to have that with buildings too, that you use uh, the building, you, you use the applications that you need and those applications make use of the hardware and the building you already have. 
but very flexible because I think no uh, beginning screen, screen of their smartphone is the same for everybody in this room. Everybody has something else or uses their, uh, their smart device in, in, in another way. So we want that for, uh, for buildings too. And then you get this ever-evolving smart building because you'll also the applications you have on your smartphone now look different than you w which you have on uh, a few years ago or what they will be in, in <coughs> five years. This also is the same for, um, for buildings, we think. So uh, also the buildings, the applications should be able to adapt, but the hardware should be solid and should be uh, working. And also, if necessary, you should be able to adapt the hardware to the new functions um, which will be needed in time. So what will the building look like? How will it feel like? Well, if you enter the building, the building will um, know that you're there. It will recognize you in your car. It will navigate you to a parking space, maybe to a charger. Uh, where you charge your car and maybe later on the day you will get a message to please remove your car and put it somewhere else so anybody, <coughs> so anybody else can, uh, can use the charger. When you enter the building, you, well, obviously don't need access cards anymore because everybody has his phone with them and the, uh, uh, through Bluetooth it will uh, know where, uh, where you are in the building and doors will open or not open and even if you want to have more security, you can use your, uh, uh, your fingerprint on your phone so uh, nobody else with your phone can enter, um, can enter different doors. And when you enter the building, the building recognizes you and can suggest free workplaces for you where you will be navigated to. This is, uh, these are actually um, features that we have already um, uh, realized in buildings. And it can actually also look at the um, different profiles of, pe of people because, for instance, if you um, want to sit with your colleagues, uh, the system can know that and what can pl place you with your colleagues or the people which you have an appointment with later on. Or maybe it can um, um, look at the profiles of your temperature and lighting feature. Maybe you like it to have a little bit more colder than other people. You like it to have 19 degrees in your, um, in your surroundings. So the building in summertime will say, okay, please sit at the north side of the building because the building has to uh, use much less energy if you sit at the north side if you want it to have a lower <coughs> temperature in summer. So um, that's where the comfort that follows, that the temperature lighting follows you through the building. Wherever you're going to sit, the building will um, automatically adjust the settings to, uh, to your likings. Well, also room booking. You book a room, you go there. Uh, if you not go there, the, the room will be, uh, become free again. Or if you left, leave early, the room will be available for other users. So you, uh, you will actually need less conference rooms, for instance, or less um, um, uh, uh, college rooms. And you can actually, if um, you want to, you can make yourself visible so that people can find you in the building and can locate you if, you, they, want to, uh, if they want to search you uh, in the building. And we also lose, use Bluetooth trackers to track stuff in the building, which is actually um, very interesting, for instance, for hospitals. <coughs> because we're now looking at hospitals where uh, we're actually doing a pilot for uh, operating rooms in hospitals where we implemented this system and where we, um, well, tagged every, uh, all the instruments and, um, and machines in the, um, in the room. So before an operation, we know exactly what's there. And if the operation is done and the patient has left the, uh, the operating room, we know also if nothing accidentally went with the patient outside of the room and um, if everything is there and if everything is valid as well beforehand as afterwards. So there are lots of different um, um, well, types of use of this. I also do the individual footprint monitoring where we give real-time feedback to how people are using the building. Um, are they sitting, uh, if, if you're the example of sitting in the north during a summer day, you lose, uh, you, you cost less of uh, CO2 than uh, sitting on the south side, but also if you uh, reuse your coffee cups or how many prints you make, it all has to do with your CO2 footprint and you can um, make people aware of what they're <coughs> using. So uh, also for maintenance, uh, it's, it's also very interesting to know how people have moved to the building. What are the hotspots? What, what parts are used? What parts aren't? And why should you, uh, for instance, clean parts of the building which you never use? 
or which aren't used in that day. You can save like 15 to 20 percent of your cleaning costs, for instance. So, um, well, we can obviously provide dashboards for managers to see all kinds of, uh, of features of these, uh, of these smart buildings, but more interesting that we can make buildings 70 percent more energy efficient, and that's a lot. And maybe more interesting than that energy efficiency is that people can act become actually more productive because they uh, don't have to uh, need to search for a workplace anymore, can find their colleagues more easier. They're, um, they're actually, well, helping, we are helping doing them their job more efficiently. And actually, if you have just 1% more productivity <coughs> with your employees, that is, uh, well, it, it, those kind of, um, uh, well, numbers, they, they <coughs> are uh, well, a lot bigger than, than what you can say, for instance, on the energy efficiency of the installations of the building. So these are very interesting. So some projects we already realized. Well, I think you recognize some of the pictures, so I won't go through all of them. The edge, of course, we're also in uh, the OVG part. The big red is already uh, the already installed. Well, this is um, an interesting project from um, um, uh, from Rijkswaterstaat, from the governmental uh, building agency, where. Um, what is interesting that we, um, well, you can see like pictures like this where you can find free workplaces. But what they also like is that we have, for instance, an, a sound pressure meter in the sensors uh, working. And what they really like is they can find uh, a silent workplace where they can work um, well, very, uh, uh, where they can concentrate better. But also this is for, uh, for education. And what's interesting here, we measured what's happening in this building also with the, uh, with the B-grid sensors. And this is where we measure that um, from all the rooms that are occupied, that uh, less than 50% is actually used. So they always had the feeling that their building was too small, by a but actually they had a lot of room left. Um, and we helped them um, notice that. And we also helped them um, well, to make that more efficient so that rooms become available whenever it people don't show up or when they're free, and which actually helped in this case, uh, well, they didn't have to build anything else because the building was large enough in the first place. Well, the Spark Compass also, where we have integrated the uh, B-Grid already in the um, building installations. And uh, this is also uh, an interesting project. Uh, this is on Skip Hall, this is the Microsoft Office building. They are actually in the last phase of their contract and uh, in the last year and, and they um, also they wanted actually wanted the smartest building in the in the world they want to um, provide uh, yeah, obviously Microsoft and they liked uh, our story also about the um, the Microsoft cloud platform that we used uh, of course for uh, the machine learning uh, aspects of it but what they also liked is that we didn't wait until the end of the contract to make this a smart building, but make it a smart building right away by implementing the sensors right away. So we have uh, like temporary sensors built in that provide some um, smart building functionalities like colleague finding or workplace finding, but more interesting of all is the building analytics. We, uh, we see how they are using their conference room, how they are using their workplaces, how they are using their, um, their, their uh, concentration workplaces. And by uh, using that knowledge, when they're going to refurbish the building, they can use that knowledge of um, how to design their building. How many conference rooms do they actually need? How many workspaces do they actually need? And um, that's very valuable information for, for them, which uh, they thought was very interesting we could provide. So, well, this, um, you already saw this one also. So, well, this actually concludes my presentation. Well, would like to... Um, and with the uh, phrase that there are lots of people, uh, lots of building people talk about on the old buildings, our buildings talk to people. Thank you very much for your um, attention. What do you mean? What kind of types well, of work? So at the TN Center, we are going to use our department to a new building next year, which is going to be an activity-based kind of work environment. And there was a, yeah, a lot of resistance from employees moving towards such a, uh, an environment. Mm -hmm. And um, I was wondering whether it's suitable for any kind of labor or any kind of work for employees. Well, I think 
um, there is a way it can work. I think sm smart building one way or the other can help in any type of working, but you really need to look at the people, the people in the building and the processes that are happening in the building because, well, um, uh, the companies are really different from each other in the way they work. So you can't just force smart building functionality up to uh, the employees that are working there. There are, um, maybe you have um, a, well, a, a very, uh, uh, what do you call it, modern company, maybe like uh, Deloitte and OVG, who very happily would be uh, adopting all those functionalities, but if you have a very conservative um, uh, um, employer, then, 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 well, you have to be a lot more careful with these kind of things. And then you're all also going to touch the, the thing of, of, uh, of privacy issues, of course, which you, um, well, you, the communication is key in, in, in all these kind of implementations. Yeah, okay. Uh, there's actually diversity issues that are, yeah, most we discussed in relation to our new work environment. Uh, so there's, um, there's yeah, of course, privacy concerns. So uh, the new building just gets out to be like a glass building, no, no yeah, personalized book spaces, but there's a lot of work done going on. So a lot of checking and uh, yeah, you know where everyone is and you checked in and you checked out. And yeah, that sounds, I mean, it sounds a little bit fun to be sure, like um, that you know exactly where I am at which day and how long I was there with who. Um, but is that something you hear back from employees or people who work at these spaces that they find that? Um, Actually, when, um, well, obviously we, we talk to a lot of clients about this uh, things and mostly one of the mo first things that comes up is, is this issue. Uh, how, do you, um, how do you manage this? this uh, um, uh, how do, are people going to like this or aren't they? So you always, what I think, that the power needs to be with the people. In, in Holland, for instance, uh, you, you can't track people in your building without them knowing it. That's, that's just illegal, so yeah, you shouldn't do that. It's the law, so you shouldn't do that. I don't know how it's in Russia, but I think <laughs> it's... Uh, we also do projects in Russia, by the way, so that's, uh, that's interesting that, uh, how they think about it. But um, in, in Holland, you, you can't do that, so you, you need to have the, the power with, with those people. And also, like tracking light or, or temperature, you always need the people, give them the power to adjust it because uh, what you like one day can be the other, can be others, uh, otherwise the, the other day. And, and um, that's also about visibility in the building. If you don't want to be visible, well, you won't, you won't be visible and you, um, you shouldn't force that up to people. You can always opt out. Uh, yeah, you can always opt out and be off grid if you yeah, like. Okay. Yeah. talking about um, smartphones and buildings and that they're kind of the same and you want to use them as the same. But um, the smartphone, after a while, the hardware gets old. We get rid of the smartphone and get a new one. So when the software is getting too advanced and we need to get rid of the hardware, how will we do that with the building? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question because that's actually what, uh, what it makes it difficult. And that's why I think uh, technology in cars uh, and, and in other... Um, and other businesses are a lot more advanced because, well, buildings tend to be there for a long time. So you have to, um, you have to adjust to that. What, what we want to do with the B-Grid is make it open enough that you, for instance, can implement other sensors when other sensors are needed, sensors that maybe we can't think of right at the moment, but uh, will be available at some point. But, but it is really difficult to think that far ahead and. Um, um, well, especially if you think like 30 years ahead, well, nobody knows what's going to happen in 20 or 30 years. So, but within 10 years, it's um, it still is possible to uh, to have a nice prediction of what's going to happen. But a good question. <coughs> Hi. Hi, I'm particularly interested about podcasts when you're testing a new organization, and, and you said the power is with the people. But in reality, we know it's not really easy to make change if the company asking you. To be part of the top SD environment, you can't really say no. So I, I, I disagree. I don't think the power is with the people. I think yeah. the thing I wanted to know. And the second is because I, I, I've read a lot of, of research that has to do with multitasking and lots of, um, of uh, signals from our environment and concentration. And um, the, all the evidence says that even in, in, the, in the environment that is changing, it's hurtful for concentration in the short term and specifically. Uh, has there been any, has there been any uh, 
survey and new reports about how these environments actually affect the productivity of the employees, their ability to concentrate and learn? Um, well, I think there are loads of uh, there are loads of, of um, uh, research is done. Well, not that very much on smart building, but a lot of, on, for instance, making people able to control light and uh, climate settings, which really help in making people more productive. There's actually a research from, I think, some guy named uh, Boersma who thought that well, if you're able to. Uh, um <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and that's, oh, maybe you have. Well, <laughs> well I'm sorry. Uh, that it's, uh, I, should, I should have uh, paid more attention on the uh, on the program, probably. But uh, well, yeah. So, and I actually read read something. You, uh, it's like four and a half percent more productivity when. Uh, oh, that's a, okay. Okay. Well, what happened? Uh, it is, um, it, um, it's like more than four and a half percent more productivity when you're able to uh, um, control the, um, uh, the temperature and lighting, for instance, for, uh, for yourself. So there is, so there is some connection with it. And I think, well, for instance, if you, say if you don't have to look for, an, um, for a workplace, or you, you used to work look for a workplace like uh, 30, 30 minutes, and now you can do it within 10 minutes, well, it's, it's obvious that productivity increases. But um, don't know really if this answers your question. Ba basically, what I'm asking you is um, I'm comparing a hotbed here to actually having a dropbed there, <coughs> which is also a external pressure yeah. in a way. Yeah. Um, the fact that we keep moving in spaces throughout the day and during the week, of course, it can have many benefits, like moving around to be more healthy, and many benefits to it. But uh, isn't it also a distraction? Yeah, it really depends. It really depends on the people. There's a there's there's a, there's a, actually a lot of well um, information, especially uh, if you've seen a lot of blogs on the internet about it. People who think uh, well, it, it it won't work at all. We should go back to the old system where everybody has its own desk because people are um, how do you call it in Holland? Uh, gewoonte dieren. They, they always want to do go to the same desk every day. In the end, um, I think that's that's true partially. Um, because if you have an open office environment, at some point you need to search for a desk. But also, um, well, it's, it's, it's very uh, dependent on the culture of the company. For instance, for if, if I look at myself, I really like to work on different places, also within the building. I don't really tend to go to one place uh, every day. But, but that's your choice. Uh, you choose to yeah, work yeah. for a different position. Yeah, so you should, that's why you should provide people always their own choice. If they want to sit at the same desk every day, they, and that's what worked for them, they should be able to do it. And but just come early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you can, I think we're talking about three different situations. We're talking about if you're old-fashioned, uh, I still go around my department, I have my own office, my desk, and I sit with a picture there with my friends and whatever. And then you have the situation where uh, companies really move to flex working or to these yeah, environments that weren't yeah, uh, data driven, for instance, and then the situation we're talking about is about a data driven environment in which that is sort of optimized. And then I think the, the in between uh, version is actually the worst version in which you have only the, the, the flex spaces, but everything is disorganized. So you're 24 in an office for 30 minutes. Yeah, that but does work. Yeah, but the whole transition to, to go to this kind of working that's what you're talking about. And uh, I think, yeah, this was a point of discussion because. Uh, I'm curious about extended memory, for instance, about the, the, the role of a stable environment when you're working in that and, and your thinking process. It's, one, it's also a concern that comes up very often uh, in that. Um, and that's particularly, yeah, yeah, that's all dependent on whether you yeah. use that. Actually, actually what we had, just the last thing I want to say, because that's, yeah. that's how we approach uh, <laughs> projects is, is we're, we're not going to people, when I present this usually to, and we're without thinking about the client at all, they think, okay, what, what's all this? I'm, I'm not gonna do this, it's way too much for me. I can't get all my people uh, to, to take, uh, um, to get used to this in, in a short notice. So I always look at what's happening in the building. So um, a, a few weeks ago, we were at, at, at a client with a large um, laboratory and they actually lost all kinds of stuff all the time. They lost like gas tanks which came in and they found it like years later somewhere else. Customer, 
it cost them a lot of money and a lot of, inc a lot of inconvenience. So, okay, well, well, we can solve this problem by taking everything that comes in and you can locate it within 50 centimeters, wherever this is in the building, always. Um, and they thought, okay, well, that's interesting. And then, um, and, and then they came with the question, okay, so um, what else can we do with it? And then you go gradually and then you say, okay, well, maybe it's interesting to use, uh, to see, to locate people in the building so you can find an expert on something, some research you're doing, you know, if he's in the building and if you're able to, uh, to go, to it, go to him. So it could be necessary too, but first we want this uh, installation to, um, well, to track things in the building because that's the most important. So you, you have to look at the clients and what's interesting for them because uh, not everything <laughs> works all the time. No, exactly. And uh, so, I mean, tracking objects is one thing and then tracking humans and, and yeah, so Yeah, it's another thing. And I was wondering what's happening to, um, to because there's a lot of metadata collected of geolocations, of, uh, yeah, of job pictures, of, of uh, interaction with people with other people perhaps. And uh, I was wondering where all the data is going, how that's stored, where, do you, where does it go? And it was stored yeah. in the box, I think. I'm not sure. Yeah, we, we, store it in, uh, we store it in this cloud platform. Yeah. But for instance, we never store information about um, individual inf information about where somebody was at some time in the building. No. It's always, um, how do you call it, uh, anonymi anonymized information, which, um, which we just don't store. So any information that could be harmful in any way. We just don't store it, so we never have the problem of leaking or uh, when it it's deleted as soon as it's deleted as soon as it's used. It's only real time, and okay. it's uh, yeah. it's it just just never stored. Oh, okay. So that's um, that's something that uh, well, you should think of at least. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because yeah, at least I was my employer once uh, saw me on my computer when I checked in, and apparently it was uh, the system at the TU where you can see when someone was at their computer for the last time, and I had no idea, and it's like. So that uh, yesterday you came in at uh, one uh, or at eight o'clock in the morning. It's very impressive. And I was like, that looks pretty spooky. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's creepy. You yeah. shouldn't you shouldn't have that kind of an environment no, exactly because exactly. that's uh, nobody will be happy. Okay. okay. Well, um, thank you so much for your talk. This You're welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah.